Uh, what I want to do is to <clears throat> try to pick up where we left off. Um, in fact, recovering some of the ground because, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had the Lord give me a few more uh, things to say within this, but um, we have been, um, uh, we've been in, let's see, where did I leave off? Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, Let's see, we're in Acts 21, and we're, this is uh, Stephen, class. <clears throat> and we were doing some comparisons the last time with Stephen and Paul. Y'all remember that? And uh, so I, if you don't, well, then I'm going to go back over it. And then you'll go, oh, I remember that now. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> um, Starting in, um, mm, gosh, well, let me just read this. I didn't even put the scripture that verse down, but it's verse 12, so it's probably 21 12, I'm guessing, <clears throat> in Acts. <clears throat> and, um, Remember, they were, they were crying and trying to persuade Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Remember that? <clears throat> we had some talks about that, and I, I'm going to want to come back and revisit that a little bit. <clears throat> um, verse 12 says, um, uh, And when we, Paul's company, heard these things, both we and they, if you will, Philip's company, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. So both companies are reacting to the prophecy which um, Agabus had, including Philip. And I think it's important that we realize that Philip was not one saying, yes, let's lay down our lives, let's go for God, whatever, whatever the cost, Jesus is worth it, his life in us, will fulfill that. It's not about us dying or it's not about us even carrying the load. It's about him and him in us, not him above, not him that can give a, a prophecy and fix things, <clears throat> but it's about him. It's always about him. And um, so uh, why were they crying? Why was this going on? because of the prophecy of Agabus, okay? Now, I want to tell you that we'll get into it, hopefully, if my notes hold up here, <laughs> we'll get into the fact <clears throat> that I've had a, <clears throat> a few little changes happen in me about Agabus. I just uh, was feeling a little uncomfortable about a couple of things, so I will come back and, and uh, add some more and maybe take out a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, so why um, were they weeping? They were weeping because of the prophecy. Uh, they were headed to Jerusalem anyway, and we didn't cover that point. They were headed to Jerusalem anyway, and they were doing it without tears, and now they're all distraught. Okay, so I'll give you that verse. That's Acts 21, verse 4. This is, ju this is just before Paul meets up with Philip's group, okay? And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Okay, so this is a completely different person in a completely different place than Agabus and Philip's group, whatever their company. So this is, and, and uh, I think I'll be able to show you other places where this was ongoing. For Paul, this was ongoing. And, you know, the whole time he's, he's finishing up his, uh, I think it's his third missionary journey, and he's slowly working his way back, and he's in Caesarea, and then, which basically is in Israel, and then he's going to be in Jerusalem. And all this time he's been getting these words from different people. Um, this says, um, 
I'm reading verse 4 again of 21. <clears throat> and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Okay. So it's, it's clear. It says, um, uh, when we heard these things then, when we heard these things then. I don't know why uh, uh, Agabus' prophecy <clears throat> seemed to elicit more problems or whatever because they were getting this along the way. But uh, nonetheless, it did. So what was Paul's reaction? Was Paul's reaction not to go up to Jerusalem? Is that it? That, okay. No, that wasn't his reaction. So I said, <clears throat> was it to reject the Holy Spirit's prophecy? No, of course not. <laughs> you know, there's only, there's only one sin that can't be forgiven. That's uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So I know as most of you are going, I don't know and I'm not going to say. <laughs> and, and that's wise. I'm proud of you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, um, um, so was it uh, was it because of the place the Spirit of Christ had in Paul's life compared to the Holy Spirit? Okay, I think it was. But here's here's why, and here's the deal: because there's not a there's not a conflict between Christ and the Holy Spirit. There's not that. So what is it? Well, the Holy Spirit was sent primarily to reveal Christ, but not just Christ, but Christ crucified. Christ crucified. He was sent, you know, he wasn't sent, you know, like, like uh, uh, in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, you know, and the Holy Spirit didn't come in there and go, you know, that baby, <laughs> this baby's going to be special. I mean, it was not like the coming of the Holy Spirit that happened in the book of Acts, which happened after the cross, which meant the Holy Spirit has come to reveal the Lamb. The Holy Spirit has come to reveal that Spirit within us. The Spirit of Christ, it's called in Romans and in other places. <clears throat> and, and that's... So that's the number one thing. I mean, the Holy Spirit could give a, <clears throat> a, a, a prophecy, and in this case did, <clears throat> and we can say that prophecy came to pass, but if we get into it, it really didn't come to pass the way it was said. I don't want to get too much into it right now, but it, it really didn't. It was very simplistic, the way Agabus said it. And there was a whole lot more going on than, than just having, you know, his hands tied and his feet tied. <clears throat> All right. So um, was this prophecy new information to Paul or his company? So I wanted, I already read this scripture. I think I did. And finding disciples, we tarried there. And they said, you know, warned him not to go. <clears throat> and... There's always this warning, it sounds like, don't go. But on the other hand, Paul is so saturated in the spirit of Christ and in the true meaning of uh, what Christianity was meant to be instead of it just being a bunch of people go into a building maybe once a week, singing, you know, putting some money in the thing, taking off. Man, they were meeting. They were meeting in the temple and house to house. They were they were moving out in the Lord, and and people were coming to the Lord, and it was it was getting crazy, yeah. crazy good, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and it was beautiful because it was clear that it was the Lord doing that, and that's what counts. Yeah. That's what counts. Well, it's the Lord doing that, but it's the Holy Spirit doing it because He's He's revealing. More of Jesus and less of us. And that's, his, that's what he wants to do. He's not here to just make us super saints. 
he's here to clip our wings so that the dove can fly. <laughs> you know? Well, he is. He is. <clears throat> so, um, so um, I, I'm going to make this statement and then read the scripture. Since the Jewish crowd from Asia accused Paul, did Paul ever say anything in Ephesus about death with Christ? <clears throat> and moving along that line, uh, well, let me read this. This is Acts 20, verse 22 through 24. <clears throat> so this is um, earlier before the whole Agabus thing, too. Acts 20, 22 through 24. Paul speaking. And now... Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save or accept that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And um, so the Holy Spirit is giving prophecies or words. I mean, the first one that we read with the disciples was, uh, uh, was simply... Um, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. That was it. So it wasn't a thus saith the Lord or whatever. But this is clearly saying, well, in advance of these both of these two things, that Paul was getting warnings by the Holy Spirit that witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But then Paul's reaction here is similar to what he said to the, to the Philip crowd and Agabus standing there and that's verse um, Acts 20 24 <clears throat> but okay let me read 23 first save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me but that's verse 24 none of these things move me none of these things move me they're not motivators to him they're motivators to us because we don't want anything bad to happen. You know? and, but they're, they're not motivators to him. And they're not motivators to those who have embraced the lamb as the, the one on the throne and as the one on the throne of our own hearts. So he says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish. And here's the part he didn't say in the other thing he says um, none of these things move me neither I count my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy what all these afflictions and all this stuff being said and everything and you're going to finish your course with joy who is she wait a minute oh sorry wait a minute there was no joy lady <laughs> it just it just meant that he could be happy with uh, finishing this course. And the ministry, woo which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So, <clears throat> so what, if, what if there was a foundation of grace that you could stand on and always stand on and not have to worry and everything else? What if there was that? What if, what if Paul's standing on it? What if there is a... Uh, a no fear attitude in in the place that he's at and in the place that he's at spiritually what if that's so foundational that it's like a, a steel rod going through him and sunk down into the rock you know and he's not going to be moved and you know and then what about us i mean you're going to face stuff there's going to be bad stuff that comes we can either face it like, okay, well, this is just me living my life. And in the world, people, things are going to happen. And then you're going to have, you know, jerks. And you're going to have stuff like that. And, and so that's just part of life. Well, what if it's not part of just life? What if it's part of the plan of God to con conform us more to the image of Christ and also to bring our hearts more to him in the way that he wants us to be? after his kind not just christian again how many how many times is the word christian used in the new testament anybody 
Yeah, I, I, Kelly's over there like this, and she goes, I'm going, is she, is she giving me the peace sign? <laughs> twice, twice Christian is only used twice in the whole Christian Bible. But guess what? It's not a Christian Bible. It's God's Word. Yeah. And it's eternal. And it has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with life. And if a person chooses life over religion, then there's going to be things happen, but there's going to be joy at the end of that. And a joy that you don't get by, you know, sneaking out of the problem. You know, because we do it all the time. And so, um, uh, so then back to Acts uh, 21, 4 through 7, now reading the whole thing together. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and when we, see, what, I mean, what kind of information is that? You know what I mean? It's like, okay, you're there with Paul and, you know, his company and all this, and you go, okay, well, don't go up to Jerusalem. Do you have any more to say about that? <laughs> you know, is there a reason why you're saying, you know, because this one doesn't, say, doesn't use that language. It's just like, just don't go up. <clears throat> Paul, Paul does not live based on um, props, all these props that we have. His life is not based on, oh no, my God, you moved that chair over here. That's confusing. It's always been over there, you know? And I can't, how, how, how do I deal with this? Shut up, no, but I mean, come on, come on. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be real. It's got to be. It's got to be more than things. It's got to be uh, more than my life, because that's why, why, where it all ended up with with Paul. It was like my life. I don't count dear for Jesus. Well, if we're counting it dear in little things, you know, somebody sat in my chair, my chair during service. I'm so upset. You know, really? You couldn't move from over there to over here? Is Deb scaring you or something? I don't know. Seeing that she's the only one on this side, I don't know. Maybe so. <laughs> she is pretty scary. Not. <clears throat> so, but I mean, my life, he's saying my life. I don't count my life. You know? He's not just saying, I'm going to, you know, onward, Christian soldiers. How many battles have you been in lately? Well, really not any, because I ran from them or I manipulated my way out of them. I'm so smart. Is that really what we want to do to the Lord? And it's easy to do. And people in this world are doing it all the time now. It's gotten way worse, meaning... It's gotten more prevalent. This is what you do. This is how you survive. You know, so you, you look at somebody like Elisha, and there's a famine in the land because he prophesied it. You know, I'm, I'm sure Elijah, Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah, and he prophesied it. I'm assuming it is. The one with the raven. <laughs> anyway, and he's, you know, he could have, you know, gotten halfway through the thing and said, you know, the, the creek has dried up. <laughs> Everything is in bad shape. Lord, why, why didn't you let me prophesy this and then send me somewhere where it wouldn't affect me? Because the Lord hanging on that cross went with us took us in there so that it, when taking us in him there would be a resurrection there would be the coming forth of his body there would be a new man there would be a new heart there would be you know not not just the same old same old religion that everybody you know seems to love so much because it doesn't demand anything so 
Um, Okay, so uh, verse uh, 6, And when we had taken our leave uh, one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. Okay, so now I want to look back at Agabus a little more. Um, I think I was a little too hard on him. I do. I think I was a little bit too hard on him. I think I, think I would say the same things I said then, but I don't want it to sound like, you know, he was not a man of God because I believe he was. Him, Philip, those of that company, they obviously weren't getting it like Paul. They were, they were going, don't go, don't die, don't give yourself, don't, you know, don't, don't live by Christ and him crucified, not I but Christ, you know, don't. You know, that's not right, obviously. But, you know, the Lord for, for years has dealt with me over this, and that is that um, if somebody has something in their heart for the Lord, then they're worthy of being honored, you know. So I just felt like I was a little too hard on him. So, um, uh, <laughs> So let me read something to prove to you how off I was. <laughs> Ready? I didn't read this to you last time, but I held up. Did God choose to highlight the life of Agabus as a prominent person in the New Testament? Was there a book of Agabus or 28 words which were not followed up by Paul? <laughs> so that's a little harsh there. <laughs> But I, I'll be, I'm going to tell you why I was that way and why I said that. And that is because there are people, and, and not so much people here, but there are people that are so into prophecy that, you know, they would take this guy that prophesied 28 words and was never spoken of again and take him over Paul and over the message of Christ and him crucified and would just lift up prophecy. Now, if you say, I don't know, yeah, there is. There surely is. And, and they're so into it that they won't, they won't even listen to you talking about, well, no, that prophecy was from God, and he should have obeyed, you know, the Holy Spirit. But this, this all ended exactly where Stephen ended. Remember, Stephen? <laughs> That spirit, he knew where he was going. He spoke in a manner to open eyes or, you know, well, if you don't like it, send me home to glory. Woohoo! <laughs> it's better than this life. Did you know that? Okay. <laughs> you know. Somebody, somebody says, you know, well, I almost had a car wreck, you know. So, you know, so is there no thought at all that you could have gone to be with Jesus instantly? You know, and like, no more taxes, no more, you know. <laughs> you know I, mean? I mean, you can go a long way with that, but ride that, that horse for a while. But, but being with Jesus, being with Jesus. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, <clears throat> so here's my statement that I felt like I needed to come back with. I am not seeking to defame, defame a man of God, Agabus, uh, but to show that these scriptures show by themselves or stand alone by themselves. God chose Paul as the main writer of the New Testament, but it is not just about quantity. He gave Paul the heart and, of the nature of God. Amen. And nobody else knew that nature like that. In fact, they always thought it was about God delivering you 
from everything. When some of the best things that ever happened in the Bible, in the scriptures, are things that people went through, like Jonah going down the belly of the whale and coming up, and then, you know, and then so many different aspects of that thing where, you know, in going through it, you, something better happened than if you had been delivered. But it would, might be more bad English here, more better for, for, for God than them, but it would not be that. It would be better all the way around. There is this thing called faith, and, and I know that we all apply that primarily to our salvation or getting healed or something like that. But there is this place called faith in, in them in them, in, in the way that they cover one another, in the way that one, if he's going through something, the other might become the Adonai that is there for them. It is precious, but, it's, but it is just words and charts on a chalkboard unless God opens our eyes to see God. And if he doesn't do that, if we're not in a position, because he wants to. I mean, he's, he's ready. He's always ready. Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. I would have gathered you. I wanted to. I, I didn't want it to end this way. That was his heart. That is his heart. He desires that none perish, but all come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, the knowledge of the truth isn't, great mysteries and 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 knowing you know like the pharisees having all the bible you know memorized so that you can impress people with you know your use of scriptures or something like that no this faith this faith is in them and it is in it is it is very much at work in a person who is going through something and they're not crying out, God, deliver me. They're going to let God choose what to do. Jesus said it best. So simple. Not my will, but thine be done. That's the best. It's, it's just so simple. It just gives a thing. Okay, you're well. Well, faith. If you have that faith, if you have faith, you know, then, then your faith is, and this is the thing about faith, it, it is, this is truly within the Greek, is that faith has to have an object. Right, Mallory? <laughs> you know? Faith has to have an object. It's not just, well, I have faith. Well, what, what's your faith in? Well, you know, I, you know, if I need something, you know, or whatever. No. Yeah, I have faith in you. I, I trust your wisdom. I trust your, your care. I trust that if things go bad, it's not going bad. It's going to lead to greater revealing of Christ in me instead of just deliverance and nothing changed. Nothing changed. We just stay the same. We react the same. We always see things the same. And we're not getting any closer to the Lord because... We're self-centered and pro-self. And that, that holds us in that place like an iron rod. And we are, you know, not going to be moved because we're going to protect ourselves to the end. But anyone in the Bible that you read or anyone that ever lived it, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't protect themselves. They put themselves. Paul put himself. I mean, all of these times it says, it referred to, you know, throughout, everywhere I go, you know, they're saying, you know, that bad things are going to happen if I go to Jerusalem and everything. And then in that, this case with Agabus, they start weeping and crying. And Paul's going, why are you doing this? You're breaking my heart. I, I must do this. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. I must. It, that must is just as strong as I, you must be born again. 
It's just as strong. I must. I must. I can't. I can't. I don't. I don't want to be about my life all the time. I'm. You know, there's a place where you can get sick of your life and just go. God, I hate this. I hate this stuff. And you want with all your heart to be about his business. His business. Not getting him on your side to do your business. See? That's treating him like your father. He's a good dad. You go, I believe that. I have faith that you are. Well, you don't seem like it. Uh, you don't seem like a very good child either. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, I mean, some of you know my background. I mean, I, my real father left when I was three years old, and my stepfather, both my real father was a crazy alcoholic, as well as my mom, and then when she remarried, my stepfather was even worse and beat us and, and abused us and all kind of junk going on. Madness. But... You know, I mean, I, I have people come to me sometimes and they go, would you pray, would you pray for my kid or whatever, you know? And I say, sure, what's, what's going on? Well, they're, you know, they've got this or that. And I'm afraid they're not going to, you know, go on with the Lord or ever get the Lord. And inside of me, there's always something that goes... That really isn't that bad. <laughs> but here's what, I, here's what I mean, though. That really isn't that bad because I know he can move on that, but he's going to move on that to get you and to get him moving on his behalf just as he's going to move on your behalf. And then we're a family, and then we're a one, and then we care for one another in that way. And we believe God for one another in that way, not just that he does miracles or, or changes everything to our liking, to our liking. See, he changes. He is the change. He is the change. Hallelujah. When the father looks and he sees his son in you, oh, you know, I mean, you got to love uh, uh, John the Baptist. He goes, you know, I'm not it, you know. I'm not the one. I'm not special. I'm not everything. I'm with him. I am, he, uh, he, is, he is greater than me. He is worthy and I'm not worthy. But it's not walking around going, oh, I'm just not worthy. <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm just an outcast that's not worthy. Stop hitting your head, Randy. <laughs> anyway, it's not that. It's not this, oh, me, you know. It is, it is oh, boy, <laughs> with Jesus. It can be that. Wonderful. Counselor. Why do you think he's got all those names? Hallelujah. Anyway, so, um, um, so you could say that Agabus never told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Thank you. Agabus never told Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. He said, if you go, this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> so when I reread that and looked at it, I went, oh, okay. You know, that changes it a little bit here. <clears throat> um, uh, he probably was just following the instruction of God by doing so. Yet, even though true, his place in the bigger picture was just to show in the Bible record a path that certainly some who seek to save would want to avoid negative circumstances and lean toward prophecy or choosing the lie for the lamb, one or the other. So, you know, you, you, in a sense, you're, it's a little bit like playing cards, excuse me, I know there's some people who, don't play cards, and some do. <clears throat> um, you know, and uh, you, you shove a card out there, 
and um, you know it might be beneficial to you or not but you you can shove a card out there that would make somebody rich or something like that and then they're gonna go well I'm not gonna go I ain't going this way we can read God's word and his prophecies according to what we want and like but you shove the card Christ and him crucified out there well that's that's not you're not supposed to be twisting that one that's one you don't twist it's eternal it's the eternal God so um, uh, so is it possible that the fact that Paul chose not to avoid the events of the prophecy speak to his and Stephen's approach concerning the high value by God of death over mere personal deliverance. Okay. Y'all seem really quiet today. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Come on up. Yeah. Love to have it. Unless you're Agabus. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just as I'm listening to what you're sharing and I'm taking it in, I'm, I was thinking about how it really parallels with some of the things that have been shared on Sunday morning about um, the series of sharings we've been on had was kicked off. You had that slide up there with the two different women's faces in the same image. Yeah. And it just depend on what your viewpoint was. So um, you either saw this ugly old lady or a beautiful young lady, and you compared it to how you could see, let's say, the slime of self, like this is really horrible and bad, or this is where Christ is going to be revealed. It's just all in the heart condition and it how is. you see it. But this is the same, I think. So um, over in chapter 20, it says um, um, that this, the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. That's neither good nor evil. It's simply what's going to be. Right. But the, right. the disciples in 21.4 say they were hearing that, but how they interpreted it was don't go up to Jerusalem. Right. They misunderstood. The, they saw the old lady in the picture. Right. But Paul is seeing the young woman in the picture. He sees that um, I'm ready to not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem. That's what he sees. So... I need more of that, that's but called, that's... That's called in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen. Um, I'll read this again. So is it possible that the fact that Paul chose not to avoid the events of the prophecy, is it possible that that speaks to his and Stephen's approach concerning the high value by God of death over mere personal deliverance. And that was my point. That was my point. And as you shared, it, it's, not, it's not against prophecy, but it is pro what's in God's heart and finding that. Got one more or another comment. Well, just that um, even with Moses, God himself would, which is in prophecy, it's God would say, I'm going to kill him. Or he'd tell Moses stuff, and Moses would be like, I'm going into death for these people. I know you. And uh, I think of Ruth and um, Orpah. And, you know, Naomi could have been like a prophet. Go back, get a husband, have a great life. And... Something in Ruth was attuned to the lamb and the slaughtered lamb and this, the good stuff. And I bet David had that happen a whole bunch. Isn't this a beautiful chalkboard? It goes back, it goes forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So anyway, that's my comment. It really shows up there. Oops. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. The old saying, what are you, six? Yeah. Um, so, um, in other words, did their uh, actions present the cross in a greater manner than just teaching the subject by mouth or by prophetic warnings? 
The answer would be yes. This is this this simple thing of a prophet saying this and then Paul not not doing it, not doing the, not heeding the warning and staying back. Um, is full of Christ and him crucified. It is full of a reality. It is just, it's there. But we just read it and go, oh, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, let's see. Um, so, after all, Agabus's words were meant as a warning, weren't they? So you, okay, so let's compare two things then. You could say, he never said don't go. Okay, so you go, that, that's one for Agabus. Okay, he never said don't go. But it is a warning that you shouldn't go. That erases your, <laughs> you know, because you, you did that. You did put it in such a manner that you were leaning toward, and even, you know, you, you might say, well, I'm just doing what the Holy Spirit says. Okay, but there's still that warning, that sense of warning, or they're, they're all, that was what I was trying to show when we first started tonight. They all broke down and started crying. They weren't crying other places. They weren't walking around going, oh my God, this is a terrible Paul. You know, they'd already been warmed a, warmed a bunch. Warmed, which is good. Uh, prior to, to this thing. So, okay. Um, notice that Philip never personally said a word after Agabus spoke. Could he? Should he? It was his home. His four daughters are all, you know, they all prophesy. If, if it was Stephen, do you think he would have spoken up? Yes. He would have. He would have. He would have said, what are y'all talking about? This is what we're here for. Hi. You know, you think waiting on tables is what it's all about? The apostles laid their hands on you. We want the, the high priest and all the Pharisees to lay their hands on us. <laughs> you got it. Good for you. <laughs> all right. So um, uh, notice that Philip never personally spoke a word after uh, Agabus spoke. Yes, he was among those and seems to be included in weeping over what might happen to Paul. Philip was. But having been chosen along with Stephen and probably knew of Stephen's death, would this have been a good time to speak up <laughs> about the value of self-giving or would his silence infer that he had learned nothing in that this area of not I but Christ? It could. I'm not saying it did. I'm just saying, would it? Could it? I know that this is the early church, but the early church was more, in a certain sense, more blessed than we are. I mean, it, it was coming out pretty good. I mean, it, it was building as it went, but it was coming out pretty good. Uh, you, especially you get Peter and uh, John jumping in the, the, the picture. You got some stuff happening. Um, but it seems that at the same time there was becoming a spread of something that seemed like nominal Christianity. It was like, well, you know. All right. So, well, I may just have to have you read this. I'm not sure. Let me try. We got 10 minutes? Okay. All right. Okay, so we want to we take note of some things, and I, I 
realized when I was going through this that I don't remember the class, but I would guess that it was probably if I ever taught a class on the book of Acts. Did I ever do that? Okay. That I went into some of the same things that I noticed again. And, and some new ones. <clears throat> but this is in, um, still in, what are we in? What chapter are we in? What? 21. Okay. Um, does verse 17 start with, and when we were come to Jerusalem? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to talk about first. Okay, so I want you to kind of picture this, okay? So you got, you got Paul, he's over here with Agabus, the whole thing's going, and he decides he's going to go to Jerusalem. So, you know, this is going to be a short trip here because the camera, you can't go too far. But he, he um, so he, he leaves, and then he, he, there's a couple of things that happen there, and then finally he comes uh, to the church leadership. This is the events, the first real events that happened when he got to Jerusalem. Okay, ready? Verse 17 through 26. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. This looks hopeful. Verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, who is the head, okay, of the church at that time. And all the elders were present. And when he had sal uh, saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. This is... Um, Luke, who, who wrote Acts? <laughs> Luke. This is, he's talking about what's happening to Paul here. Um, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousand of the Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children. Who is this talking? This is the, lead, the elders of the church and James, who is the presiding leader of it and they come in and they they talk to they uh, have him talk and they um let's see i'm going to read that again uh, and when they heard it they glorified the lord and said unto him thou seest brother how many thousand of jews there are which believe believing jews and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Agabus didn't say anything about that. That had to be a, a sucker punch for Paul. For Paul, oh my Lord! So the the prophecy of Agabus was just that the Gentiles would get him, or, or the uh, Jews would get him, bind him up, and turn him over to the Gentiles. Oh boy, he's, he's fixing to take a long ride of just bad stuff now. Okay, all right. So. Um, uh, verse twenty one, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk after the customs. Verse 22, what, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, uh, together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that all may know all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law is this heartbreaking yeah. this is just heartbreaking oh, lord 
Verse 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, which, you know, never mind, no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangle and from fornication. Verse 26, then Paul took them in and the next day purifying himself with them, he entered into the te temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Wow. Folks, Jesus took away all offerings. Yeah. And let me say it like this. He fulfilled. He fulfilled them. Fulfilled means to fill full. No more room for other offerings. He fulfilled it. And they're saying, go do this. And, you know, we've got all these, these Jews here that have, have turned to the Lord, but they're hearing bad things about you. And so they need you to do something to prove to them that you're, you know, still Jew. Whereas in Ephesus and so on, Galatians, Paul taught there's neither Greek nor Jew nor bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. This is, this is a slap in the face of the Lord. <clears throat> so the church leaders, in order to find peace, people are always trying to find peace, in order to find peace, put Paul in this whole situation had he not been required to go to the temple, he probably would not have been noticed in Jerusalem. Keeping the law was their big issue. So you remember Agabus? Back to Ag Agabus and what's going to happen? The church leaders put him in that position. The church leaders. No, I'm talking about Jim and Scott. And, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Just... <laughs> And Mike, <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> but that's, that's terrible. So, um, uh, had he, let's say, I think I read all of it. Keeping the law was their big issue. What time is it? Oh. Yeah, well. To be, to be honest with you, um, To be honest with you, what I have left after this is just the events that happen, okay? So he goes to the temple to go do this, and then these, uh, these Jews from Asia, I mean, there's some good stuff in relationship to uh, Asia being uh, Ephesus, and there was an accusation that Paul had taken an Ephesian guy into the temple, which he didn't do. And it's kind of cool to read Ephesians and then go back and look at, at what it says. And then, and then it just takes the next step of what happens. And then the next step, he's, he's taken by soldiers. And, well, before that, I mean, once they get him outside the temple, it is... It is um, uh, Stephen's process of attack all over again, just like Stephen. And so Paul does just like Stephen. He says, can I talk to the people? And he starts talking to them. And they start... Um, throwing up dirt in the air <laughs> and doing all this weird stuff, you know, like gnashing on the teeth, you know, just throwing all this dirt in the air. And he's going, the, the, the centaurian and the captain is going, what is wrong with these people? What did you do? So you can read it for yourself. It'll, it'll go all the way down to the bottom of this chapter. Um, ending with verse 40. Well, was that worth all the trouble? 
Father, we just thank you for your son, and we thank you that you, you put him in us. Father, we want you to know we love your son. We want to look at you in your father's face and say, we love your son. We, we love him, and I know that, that touches your heart to hear us talk about your son that way, because you love him. <clears throat> and we want the full work of what Calvary was meant to bring about to be brought to bear in our lives. We want it to be real. We want us to be real and be in a situation, in a spiritual place that we could flow with you. And maybe many here or maybe some here are not yet in that place, Father. I pray no condemnation on them. I pray just your your steady, loving hand to touch them and bless them and keep them and let them know that they are fathered. And uh, so, Father, in your time, all things. But, but for us, many of us here, there's also this, uh, this desire, Christ increasing and us decreasing. It's, it's not a hard, horrible thing, not a, not a terrible thing. It's a wonderful thing to, to many of us. If that could happen, if that could just continue in so many ways so that we have the fullness of Christ in us who has the fullness of the Godhead bodily in him. So thank you, thank you for these classes. Let the word, not just my sharing on it, but let the word be rich and real and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you, Father. And Father, I also just thank you for keeping everybody while we were away, those of us who were gone. Thank you for your loving kindness that's better than life, taking care of them and taking care of them in the heat and taking care of them in their needs, covering them, you still using them and blessing them. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.